<clears throat> Hi there and welcome to Radio Eden and welcome to our second talk on the book of Jude. Uh, this talk is called uh, The Final Call to Alertness. You see a lot of guys on here and, um, and that's a real problem with many of them. And uh, even though I'm not going to cover all of them in this talk, um, I just want to highlight a few of them. Now, as Christians, we can have two approaches to, to all of this. Yeah. We've got all these guys, they've all got special messages, they come on television, they sound very bombastic, uh, they tell you what a lot of people want to hear, you know, to get rich, to have more money, to live a better life, more comfortable life, your best life now, that's what this guy talks about. Todd Bentley, Big Lakeland Revival, uh, we've got all the other guys, and um, it's safe to say, um, I'm not quite sure whether I'm 100% right here, I'm not sure about this guy here, please follow the mouse, um, but all of the other guys, they're millionaires, and they're millionaires on the back of preaching some stuff about the Bible, allegedly about the Bible, which um, again... Um, we will not cover this particular issue at the moment, but a lot of things these guys say, they are not biblical and they are not based on the Bible, but they come from, from somewhere somewhere else. Um, the big question is, what are we going to do? Um, and one of the problems most of us do is we, we see all these guys and we see all these things which carry on and obviously... Um, it's a bit of a problem. Yeah. These guys claim to be prophets of God, and if you go against a prophet of God, you effectively go against God. So a lot of us play it safe, and we don't go against these guys. We just let them carry on, probably get a bit embarrassed when people at work talk about these guys. And, uh, and what we don't realize is that these guys are not really of us, and they give Christianity a really bad name. They are money pendlers. Um, I think about 100, 200 years ago, you would have these guys would have been snake oil merchants, and that's what I I would call most of them today snake oil merchants. Yeah, they sell you some some potion of something. Um, they want you to believe in the potion, um, but but basically it doesn't really do anything. On the contrary, it might harm you and damage you as well. Now, as Christians, I'm just looking for my mouse here. We can. Be like these ostriches here. Put the head in the sand and, and just forget about this and pretend it's not there. Or we can take action and uh, we can stand up and we can say, look, we are Christians. We love the Lord Jesus Christ. We, we uh, respect his word. We respect God. But what these guys do and who these guys are is not what we stand for. They are standing for something, uh, something else. At at best, they are deluded and they are misguided. At worst, they are placed by the enemy and they are here to defame Christianity. And, um, and many of them, they are just there to line their pockets and to get rich in the process. Uh, we have got Coons from Rockwell Ministries. If you go to his websites, uh, Rock Wealth, it's called, yeah. Uh, dot com, I think. Um, but anyway, if you go there, it's all about seed and money, and that's really what it comes down to. Peter Popov, um, this guy here, is quite interesting when you look at some of the, the ways he's been exposed in the past, in the 80s, uh, where he pretended to have messages from God, and he had a little microphone, and um, his wife, who collected the prayer cards in, was giving him information through um, an intercom system connected to a little earpiece hidden in his ear. And um, and yet, I mean, he was um, he was uncovered, yeah. And people, uh, a researcher, a journalist, has exposed this guy, and he had to file for bankruptcy, even though he must have had millions in his bank account at the time. And and yet, ten years later, he's still on the stage. Yeah? He's still doing his stuff, selling miracle water, miracle salts, miracle manna, and mystic salts and, and lots of other weird stuff which is which is just paganism it's got nothing to do with christianity and and this guy he's just um, he's exactly one of those guys he's a very good speaker he's very charismatic but read jude and then listen to one of Popov's sermons and you know what jude is talking about he is one of those false teachers identified in jude um we've got todd bentley you know uh, again he's pretty much known he has had a his so-called revival meeting uh, whilst having uh, an affair. And um, obviously he talked about, I think he's the only one in this group, he is not a millionaire, 
Uh, he talked about uh, having a multi-million dollar ministry. And at that point, I'm, I'm asking myself, what is this all about if I'm talking about multi-million dollar ministries? It, it's almost like um, an oxymoron. It's like talking about Black Milk or, or, or something else. Um, if you go into ministry, you should minister not with the purpose of getting rich, not with the purpose of making the big dollar, but you should minister with the purpose to reach out hearts and to reach people for Jesus Christ and for eternity. And um, and I despair when I see these people. I really despair. Uh, they are a shame. They are a blemish on Christianity, and and we need to um, we need to see this, especially. You know, go through the book of uh, Jude and uh, please listen to the first talk on Jude as well and, and where it's ex sort of being gone through in an exp expository manner. So that's verse by verse. And then just compare these guys. Um, I mean, I talked about this guy here, Kenneth Copeland. He's got his own airport, his own uh, airplanes, you know, to go to his meetings, um, connected to his ministry. So he doesn't, doesn't he? it's just like... it. Just beckons belief when you when you see what these guys are, are getting up to, and and uh, what is going going on with these guys. I'm I'm convinced um, that um, that there are real real problems. And as I said, at best they are just deluded and deceived, and um, they um, they are splurting out stuff they don't know about. I mean, Kenneth Copeland has said a lot of stuff which is unbiblical. It's got no biblical foundation, but based on his personality. Uh, he, um, you know, he he has got the authority, I guess, to 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 try and convince people that he's right, and and people believe he's right because he's so successful. You know, he's extracted so much money from believers uh, with a good will and a good heart. Um, anyway, uh, another one of the worst culprits is this one here, Mike Murdoch. Um, I encourage you to read a book by Trey Smith. Um, it's called Thieves. Um, Trey Smith knows this guy personally. He um, used to hang out with his son, and um, and he had a glimpse of his lifestyle on the inside, what his life is all about. Um, Jesus says that by the fruits we will recognize them. He warns us of false prophets and false teachers, and he says by the fruits we will recognize them. Uh, if you read this book, you get a very good insight what this man's life is all about, and about the fruits he is displaying in his life. This guy is probably one of the most crooked preachers I've come across. I don't know the insides out, the inside outs of the other preachers. Some of the stuff has been made public, um, but but when you look at that, you when you look behind the scenes, you you see lies, intrigue, um, you see um, you see anything but what you expect from 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 somebody who serves the Lord Jesus Christ with all his heart and all his mind and all his soul. It's just horrendous. It's absolutely horrendous. So, my friends, I, I would encourage you to take your, I'm not saying you're an ostrich, but um, to, to not follow the ostrich, but to take the head out of the sun. Really open your eyes to these people and see what's going on, you know, and, and look at the fruits of these guys. And what we see, we've got, we've got infidelity, we've got wife beaters, we've got promiscuity, we've got lies, we've got uh, pretense, we've got... Uh, We've got deceit at the highest level, deceiving the public. We have got heresy at a, at a vast amount. We have got leading people astray. Uh, we have got greed. We have got uh, the love of money, you know, more and above anything else. Um, I've got, a, I saw this little diagram here um, about these three guys, Mother Teresa, John the Baptist, and the Apostle Paul. Uh, they call them the prosperity gospel dropouts. What's gone wrong with these guys? Yeah. Uh, John the Baptist eats bugs and honey and has got zero fashion sense. The Apostle Paul is in and out of jail. Uh, he makes tents with his own hands to feed himself so that he's not a burden to anybody. And and yet, no doubt, he is uh, one of the greatest ministers around. And interesting as well, it's not called the Paul ministry, but Paul just ministers for Jesus Christ. Now, when you look at these guys here, they've got the the um, the Kenneth Copeland ministry. I mean, he calls it rock wealth, at least the, um, the the name kind of refers what it's all about. It's all about being wealthy. We've got the Peter Popoff ministry. Um, Mike Murdoch is a name in his own right. Skriflo Dollar as well in his own right. But um, 
as soon I think if if somebody comes along and he calls his ministry by his own name, you know you're heading for trouble. There's something a uh, bit of the problem. Okay, what is this talk all about? Um, the Bible is not hard to understand. That's my um, that's what I stick to. And the New Testament and the Old Testament, we've got them both. Um, and the NT is key to the Old Testament, yeah. And, and really, all you need to do is stick your nose in the book, spend some time with the Bible, go through it, and, um, you know, take the Bible in. It, it's not that hard to understand. If you read it for the first time and you haven't really got a Christian background, it's sometimes a little bit confusing. But, but go to some Christians, get some advice, you know, start reading the Gospel according to John, then the Gospel to Luke, and then read the other Gospels. Start reading Acts. And then just start reading uh, the um, uh, the epistles. We've got the epistles Paul has written. Um, some of them are a little bit intense, and you really need to have a Jewish background or uh, um, um, a Judaistic background to understand them. Um, but but really, if you um, you know get your head a little bit around it, and you hang out with Christians, and you ask them a little bit about it, it's not that hard. Not that hard to understand. Uh, we've got Paul who defines um, our theology, our faith. Then we've got James who refocuses the message of Paul. Paul says, you know, salvation is by faith only. It's just by faith, by nothing else. Your works are not going to do anything. If you do any works, they have to be done through God. God will reveal yourself through your weakness, and he will work through your weakness. And James just says, you know, look, you know, it's not just, you know, blind faith or whatever. I prove um, your I prove my faith to you through the works I do. So he kind of puts a little bit of a focus in. So if you say, you know, you are a believer and you believe in Christ and, and your life doesn't really bring the fruits, you know, you're not really a loving person, you're not really somebody who is good, but you're still crooked, corrupt, uh, mean, um, uh, greedy, given to, to drink, or, or whatever it may be. There, there's an indication that something is not, not on the right tracks. Uh, John reminds us of the real issue, which is our relationship with God. That's really what it comes all down to. Peter gives us some everyday um, tips and advice, you know, how to live as a Christian. And then we've got Jude, who gives us some last-minute insights into the church and the issues we face throughout the ages, and I believe especially towards the end. Um, uh, again, if you read through Matthew 24 and... Um, you um, you go a little bit, you know, what Jesus says about the end times. It's a suggestion that there will be a lot of false teachers and a lot of false prophets around who try to lead us away and who try to lead us away from God. Um, Jude writes his letter to those who are called you know, and sanctified by God the Father and preserved in Jesus Christ. It's very important as well. So it's not really a letter to non-Christians, but it's a, a letter to Christians. Um, in one instance, Jesus says, many are called, but few are chosen. And that's what we've got in Matthew chapter 20, verse 16. And, and the problem we have here, that, that really everybody, you know, if you've got uh, breath, you can walk, you can think, you're called, really, you're called. Um, but only few are chosen. Why only few chosen? Because very few respond to the call. Uh, the call is going out worldwide. If you hear his call, if you hear the message of the gospel, um, it is up to you whether to respond to it or not. If you respond, God will come into your life and, and, and something new, something great, something amazing will start. If you reject and you refuse, um, then you have to bear the consequence. And, and Jesus said, you know, um, in, in the Sermon of the Mount that about the way that wide is the way and wide the gate and narrow the way, it's more the gate and only few will find it. Only a few will find the narrow way. And... And that's a prophecy, you know, when when the era is over, we will see that the majority of people, unfortunately, will not respond to Christ's call. And and the only alternative for them is, is hell. And, and only few will respond to the call and they will come in and, and they will reach out to Jesus Christ and, him, and ask him into, into their lives. Um, so many people are called but not chosen. That means they're not sanctified, they're not preserved in Christ. And that is a big problem. Um, now, Jude carries on, and he looks at, you know, people who try to, to not really come in through the gate with Jesus Christ, but they climb over the fence. 
in an effort to, you know, carry on with their lives as they are, but at the same time, you know, gratify what they perceive as some sort of religious need. And you get Christians which are religious, or um, in other words, they're just false Christians. And and they come into the church, maybe they are born as a Christian, maybe they are brought up in, in Christianity, and they consider this to be, to be their religion, but they don't really have a relationship with Jesus Christ. They are not really regenerated. They are called, but they are not chosen because they have never, never responded to, to the call God has placed upon their lives. And they have never invited Jesus to come in and to be their Lord and their Savior. And, and what we find is we, we find a group of false Christians who are not regenerated. The Spirit of God is not in them. They are not sanctified. But that means God is not doing a work in them to become holy, to become better, to display the fruits of the spirits as they, they grow in God. Um, but there's just nothing there. They're dead, really, as far as, as the Bible is concerned. Um, and, and the problem is they're in the church. And sometimes they rise to power in the church. And, and what we get is, at the end of it, we get examples of Christians who are not real. So they're really bad examples. Um, the doctrine they produce is not real because it's not inspired by, by God. By the Holy Spirit. There's a lot of error in their thinking and in their theology and in their um, in their ways. And then obviously the reputation may be down as well. And so we, we might get, like some of these guys we've seen before, who may have come somewhere in the church and they, they're pursuing something, but they're not really regenerated people. And and um, biblical example, you know, you, you recognize the tree by its fruit. So if there are no good fruits, it's it's not a good tree. And and these guys, they don't produce good fruits. There's no humility in their lives. There's no love in their lives. There's no um, no kindness in their lives. But obviously it's on the other side. You know, there's greed. There's the love of money. There, there is, um, there is uh, rebellion. There's heresy. There's bad doctrine. And, and lots of other things which is in there. There's big ego problem with, with many of these guys. Scratch their ego and they will... Uh, um, they will go up, you know, blow up like a like a grenade. Big problem we've got there. And and these guys, they're in the church. So again, many are called, few are chosen. Problem is, within the church, we've got a lot of religious people, you know, who somehow they end up within the church as Christians, but they've never really made a commitment to Christ. And maybe if this is you, if, if you feel you've never really made a commitment to Christ, then and in your own life, you can't really see any of those fruits. You can't really see that there's a relationship with Jesus Christ. I, I just want to encourage you, and I, I want you to just go on your knees and, and invite Jesus in your, in your heart and say, please come in. Please, you know, take over. I can't do it by myself. I need you. I believe that you are the Savior, that you are the Messiah, that you are the Lamb of God, that you have died on the cross for my sins. And I'm sorry for everything wrong I've done, for everything I've done that offends you, God. I'm very sorry, and I don't want to do it again, and I need you to, to change me, to live a better life, to become a better person. If that is you, then please do this. Don't, don't hesitate. Don't even wait for this talk to finish, but do this right now. <clears throat> so, I mean, one thing Jude says is we have to fight for the faith, contend for the faith. And I'm not talking about jihad or anything like that, yeah, just to clarify it from the onset. But we need to fight for the faith, because our faith is in tatters. And all I challenge you to do is turn on Christian television, listen to the guys you see on there. And if your experience is anything like mine, you will find that about somewhere between 70 and 80% of the people who are on there, they are just charlatans. They are just um, snake oil merchants. They are people who abuse the word of God for their own lucid gain. And, um, and as I say, many of them have been exposed and yet people still fall for them. Um, anyway, Jude is concerned about our common salvation, the salvation which is there for us. Yeah? And these guys, they come along and they just rip it apart and they turn it into something else. And he wants us to earnestly fight for the faith. Um, and then he says, certain men have crept in unnoticed, who long ago were marked out for this condemnation. Ungodly men who turn the grace of God into lewdness and deny the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. Lord Jesus Christ. 
Um, again, they've crept in unnoticed. They, they just, they're in the church, they grow up in the church, or they're suddenly there. They do the college thing, maybe the seminary thing, and suddenly you've got these big preacher men rising up, telling everybody what to do, and um, and and they, in this instance, they turn the grace of God into lewdness, and they deny our only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. A lewdness means licent licentiousness. It means they um, they they're sort of a little bit like anything goes. You know, it doesn't really matter what you do. You know, it's okay. And when you listen to these guys we are we are dealing with today, and you've seen at the front of the page, most of them, they've got some special wisdom, they've got some special ideas, um, but they don't really uh, talk about sin. They don't really tell you to repent. There's nothing there. They they talk a lot about obedience and to buying them. I mean, Mike Murdoch make, makes a big thing, and he says to delay, delayed obedience is disobedience, and that is when you have to to give him your money so that the miracle of the seed can work. And and that is just manipulation, just total manipulation. Uh, but anything else goes. It doesn't really matter. It doesn't matter whether you, you are a rotten sort, whether you beat your wife, whether you, uh, you are a mother who's got no grace for their children, whether you steal, you defraud. It doesn't matter. It's, it's, Never on the agenda. Nobody tells you about this. Whether you, you are unfaithful, even in your heart. Uh, whether you, you break contracts. Whether your word is not reliable or not. Whether you, uh, you don't love God with all your heart. doesn't matter. As long as you do what they tell you to do, which is to send them your money and you know, wait for the magic miracle and get the miracle salt, the miracle water, or whatever it may be. It's it's just crazy. It's just crazy what these guys are doing, and uh, and and they are they are blemish within Christianity of the twenty first century. They are big blemish. What is the church all about? It's it's a big question as well. We need to understand what the church is. Yeah, the church first of all is not a big building somewhere in the middle of town with a spire and uh, some bells. That's not really church in a biblical context. When you look in the days of Paul. And when you look at the first century, church was taking place in people's homes or in some pub where they rented a room. But it didn't really take place in dedicated buildings. That that only came sort of in the fourth and fifth century when, you know, church took the status of, you know, what pagans had. Pagans had their temples, so the church had to compete somehow. So they built up their own big buildings, or they took over pagan temples and turned them into churches. Um, church really is, is a totally different thing. Uh, it's all about people. That's the first thing. It's, it's, we find that people from all walks of life, they have a common experience. They encourage one another. They sing, they worship, they learn together about God. They pray, help, and support one another. It's an expression of unity and oneness in Christ, uh, where you really care for one another. You live out the love Christ has poured out in your heart. They have a real relationship with God. They are led by the Holy Spirit. The lives are turned around and people are renewed from the inside out. Um, one point which I haven't put on here, I thought I had, but it's not there. Um, it's about proclamation as well. Church is about proclamation. It's about getting out there and telling other people about Jesus Christ. And whether they accept it or not is up to them. I mean, Jesus told us only few will accept it. Only few will find the narrow way. Um, but anyway, that's our job to do. And that's really what church is all about. And very often, when we look at church today, we find uh, an organization, some sort of institution. We find that there is um, um, a building, very often, and things go around a building. There's a preacher, you know, and the preacher man, he does everything, he controls everything. Uh, maybe there's some elders as well, some volunteers. And and it's, it's it's very much institutionalized today, and I don't think that from the early days it was meant to be in that way. Um, but it's it's different. I found, um, for example, the church where I go to, uh, we meet in a in a school where a room is just rented for a Sunday, and um, there's no preacher, paid preacher as such, uh, just a bunch of people who do the preaching, and um, and then on. Um, 
what I find is very often the best time is right at the end of the meeting where, you know, people have tea and coffee and and something uh, to eat, maybe a biscuit or something. And and people really talk about, you know, what moves them, what's going on in their lives and, and they encourage one another. And that's what I find is, is one of the the big things and one of the important things. Church is a pleasant community in a cruel and difficult world to live in, or it should be. It's not always the case. I mean, I've heard of other examples as well, where church is just like a, a horrible place to be, and there's a lot of backbiting and power struggles and and, and other stuff going on. Yeah, so you might be better going to your um, aquatic tank club, um, you know, once a week and hang out with people there than, than to the church. Uh, Anyway, church should be about protection, care, support, love. Um, it's about hope. It's about future, your future. It's about life and, and answers in life, uh, which, which, where you sort of try and go to the church to, to try and find these, but most of all to support you in your relationship with Jesus Christ. What we find in this world, though, is totally different. It's about hate, survival. It's greed, envy. It's evil. And we're always looking at victims. When I look at this world, I often feel like this little bird. There's a nasty snake behind us and it's about to swallow us. And uh, we've got a little bird not realizing what's going to happen to him. And and that's very often what this world is like. You wake up one morning and you've got the news that you've got cancer or your husband or wife has died or in a car accident or you've lost your job or um, you uh, you don't know how to pay the bills for the next month. I've been through all this stuff. As well, I mean, obviously not, <clears throat> I haven't died or anything as yet, but uh, but like your job, you wake up one morning and um, you are going to be made redundant and your life is, is, is changing uh, all the way around. And it can be very traumatizing. Uh, and that's what this world is all about. The church is different. It's about looking after you, making sure you're okay. You know, a bunch of believers getting together, seeking God, you know, in when problems occur in this world, to, to just try to make another day, to make another another um, another year, and, and to move on in life. Um, so anyway, you've got this nice, pleasant, you know, benevolent community in an evil, greedy, horrible world, and so a lot of people are naturally attracted to 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 the church if it's a working church, if there is this loving community there. Uh, even though they may not necessarily be Christians. They just want to have this community or this fellowship. And so they come into this church without necessarily knowing who God is and who Jesus Christ is for them. What I see is your people experience something. They have some sort of conversion experience, but never break through. They never really uh, break through with God. They never really allow Jesus to come fully into their lives. And... The result is that they are without the Spirit of God. The Bible talks about if you are born of the Spirit in John 3, that uh, the Holy Spirit comes into your life. And and when you sort of read what the Holy Spirit is all about, it's about leading you into truth, helping you to understand who Jesus Christ really is, leading you, convicting you of sin and, and righteousness at the same time, and instructing you in um, in the ways of God. So, so that is really the, the concept of the Spirit of God. Now we've got these people suddenly in the church who never break through, and they are there without the Holy Spirit, without the Spirit of God, without the instruction by God himself. And they are sort of stumbling along within this community. Sometimes people are attracted to church people. It happens, and sometimes they get a sense that um, there's real life. But um, all they do is they walk in the shadow of the saints. So they uh, they don't really take on the life for themselves, you know, the true real life in Christ, but they just live of others who are walking in the reality of being a child of God. Some people see the church as a soft target to fulfill their own vision. And, and this is a real problem as well. Um, I've heard recently about Christian music, and one guy made, made the point that a lot of top Christian musicians on the scene, they, um, they're not really Christians. They, they're they good musicians. The competition within the world is pretty pretty tough and pretty high. So somehow they stumbled into the Christian music market and instead of singing uh, secular songs, they sing songs with a Christian connotation. They make it somehow, but, but really they are not, not Christians. And there were two issues recently. There was one Christian, so-called Christian artist 
who came out as um, as a, a, a gay person, yeah, which again in Christian terms is it's not really possible. I mean, you, you can be gay, but if you want to pursue a gay lifestyle, it um, it is a big problem. Yeah, it it just doesn't fit in. If you um, if obviously people may struggle with those tendencies, but um, but the Bible is very clear on these subjects, and and yet there are two top musicians. One of them had even the audacity to say that um, you know that is what she is, and she you know found a partner, and she wants to be together with this partner, and if God is against it, let God strike her. That's what she said, and um, I find this quite shocking. That's just total rebellious, rebelliousness, rebellion, and and again, um, one speaker. He was sort of doing some research in this area, and and a lot of Christian bands, none of them, none of the people who uh, you know play the music had a conversion experience, and they're not really into this. They are, they're just good musicians, and um, the statement was made that maybe um, one in ten bands <clears throat> is made up of real Christians, um, and the rest are just you know uh, people who went into the Christian scene without being Christians. If it's true or not, I don't know. But what I would like to challenge you is, is look closely at those people who produce Christian music. The big problem we have is not really music, which is, comes from the heart, like it maybe used to be about 20, 30 years ago. If you were a Christian musician, you, you weren't in it to make money. But it's totally changed. Suddenly, the Christian music scene is very profitable. And uh, you get managers, you get um, labels who encourage um, maybe Christian music to be produced without really looking what's behind it, and whether it really is Christian music or whether it is made by real Christians or it's just by, um, by something else. Um, we've got other people as well who want to fulfill their own vision. We've got those mega preachers, you know, some of them just want to be rich and they find a nice platform. They make big words, they draw big crowds, and very often the big money seems to follow. And then we've got simply money peddlers or snake oil merchants, as I mentioned before. It's a big problem we are dealing with within the church. Um, what is the strategy of the enemy? We need to understand the enemy and we need to see the way he operates. Yeah, it's very important. Um, he hates God, he hates the object of God's love, and that's us. We are the object of God's love, that's mankind. And I'm not sure, but I assume that he's probably self-deluded and assumes that he can out-trick God, that in, maybe even in the future he can win against God. I don't know, you know whether this delusion goes that far, but one thing is for certain, um, he is in to destroy mankind. And that is his ultimate aim. Uh, aim number one is for him is stop people to come to the knowledge of the truth. So that is of Jesus Christ and that he died for you. That you can have peace with God. You can enter into a relationship with God through Jesus Christ. He wants people not to know about this. And he does everything to ridicule this message. To make this message irrelevant. And to lead people aside this message. Uh, he wants to lead people to destruction. Sometimes even to self-destruction. So his aim is, you know, if somebody's dead, he cannot come to Christ. So kill as many as he can. And he plays his games, his lucid games, to, to kill millions, if, if need be, um, to, to not let them come anywhere near the truth. He wants to twist the truth to avoid people from understanding it. Yeah. So that's again, is one of his aim. Take the truth, but not 100%, only 90%, and then crucial 10%, they're going to be twisted around and suddenly it turns into something else and it's into something completely different. And it's a bit like what we find with the fall of man um, when the devil was talking to Eve. It was 90% truth and only 10% lie. And yet this lie made all the difference. Once he's lost people to Christ, yeah, once you've come to Christ, you're a child of Christ, you've been purchased by the blood of the Lamb, you belong to Jesus. Um, and he has lost you. You're lost for the devil. So what can he do to try and, you know, do some damage control from his perspective? And what he tries to do is he tries to make you ineffective in your walk with God, in your ministry, in your proclamation of the truth, 
and then he works for the kingdom of God. That's, that's his name. Make you ineffective of what you can do for God. And if you can manage this, then you're no danger for him. There's no danger that somebody else will come to Christ, you know, maybe in your family or in, within your circle or, or whatever. And he's got several ways of doing this. I mean, one of them is that he tries to persuade Christians to live in a ghetto. Yeah. Go to your little church, do your little church thing, but don't have secular friends. Don't go out there and talk to people who are not Christians. And if you go out there to people to, you know, who are not Christians, just behave like them, get drunk with them, and so on. So you can feel guilty afterwards, and he can condemn you. And that's pretty much his, his, his scheme and what he tries to do. But, but what he doesn't want is he doesn't want you to, to be a good, faithful, strong Christian who has got a clear understanding of who God is, of the love of God, of the freedom in Christ, of the, um, you know, he doesn't want you to, to walk a straight walk, a walk of holiness, to be sanctified, to live a life of love, um, purity and holiness. He doesn't want you to do this. So he tries anything to try and move this about. So one of his schemes is he trips you up and we all fall. There's no question about it. And, um, and you just feel condemned. He condemns you. He stands there with a big finger and says, who do you think you are? You think God is still loving you? Look what you have done. Look at yourself, you rotten sinner. And, and yet God loves you. I mean, the Bible talks about the righteous, and it talks about that the righteous will fall seven times, and he'll get up seven times. And it says about the wicked, they just fall. Yeah, nothing else, no getting up, no nothing. You can fall as a righteous person, and you will fall. Uh, but you need to rise up, and you need to repent, rise up, move on. That's really what you need to do. Repent, rise up, move on. And, and that should be our, our aim. Aim for holiness. Aim for, for walking the way God wants you to walk. Aim for doing the right thing all the time. Aim for being strong. But don't be, don't be intimidated by the enemy. And don't be intimidated by the enemy once you fall down. But rise up. You know that God loves you, that God will forgive you. And he will strengthen you. What you need to do is repent. Repentance is not feeling miserable about yourself and sort of beating yourself up for a long time. Repentance is about turning away from your sin with Flintstone mindset. This is sin. I've done it. I don't want to do it. It's facing up to your sin and, and naming it what it is. I've done wrong. I've sinned. And turning away from it. You know, with uh, a mind of steel. Turn away from it. That's repentance. So it's not feeling miserable about yourself, but it's turning away from from what you've done wrong anyway that's pretty much the strategy of the enemy and and that's what he wants to do um, so he tells people's lies he distorts the message of salvation he makes makes man attractive to unbelievers yeah so make you unattractive to unbelievers or, um, or others uh, any, any, anything to, to try to get the unbeliever to not go anywhere near the gospel, not go anywhere near the gospel. Turn them religious, that's the other thing. So if people really need to, you know, have some religious experience, he's going to give it to them. He turns them religious. He even sends them to church, you know, doing the religious thing. But, um, but no true freedom in Christ, no true relationship with Christ. Do some stuff, you know, follow some rituals, you know, make people be good Christians, but... But, you know, by reading the Bible, going to church every every Sunday, you know, doing X, Y, and Z, but no real life is Christ, no surrender to Jesus Christ. That's what he doesn't want you to do. He wants to kill your joy and your freedom in Christ. And that's, he tries to do in many ways. But again, you don't need to listen to that. You can turn away from it and you can turn to Christ and renew your joy and freedom in him. He wants to invade the church with his people and he's doing it all the time. Um, and, and I've seen this so many times over the years that there are needy people coming to church, some of it justified, but they're not interested in really coming to Christ, but they're interested in, in, in something else, maybe in sympathy or in material goods or, uh, or you know, just in having some sort of, um, you know, platform where they can, you know, mouth their ideas or whatever they think. And, and sometimes the church is an idea place to be because people tend to be nice or nicer than elsewhere and sometimes people find an ear whereas they wouldn't find an ear anywhere else. Appeal to the flesh and make it look religious and we've got this with the prosperity gospel. When you look at the prosperity gospel and you dissect it and you see what's behind it, it's just like total appeal to the flesh. 
who doesn't want money, who doesn't want to be rich, who doesn't want to have toys, who doesn't want to not have to worry about his bills um, and uh, not needing to trust God on a monthly basis to make ends meet. Who doesn't want to do this? Yeah. Everybody wants to be rich, you know, not have any monetary issues. And, and so it's not necessarily the way God wants it to be, but it's uh, an appeal to the flesh. And it makes it look religious at the same time, you know. The Bible talks about prosperity, and, and so they come up with their 10, 15 verses, uh, which have been ripped out of context. And uh, they talk about seeds and other stuff. Um, the tragedy of it all is not just the, the heresy that's behind it. The tragedy is that, that they are sucking you dry, and these guys becoming incredibly rich out of it. And they use you know, their own experience as an example for you. But all it means really is they're very good at manipulating you and parting with your cash. Um, strategies of the enemy, fake Christian leaders, you know, how do we recognize them? I mean, Jude talks about this, and again, I appeal to you go to the previous talk. Um, some of the leaders, they come up with a new truth. So something which has not been done before, not been heard before. So they've got some new special insight, which will have this great impact on your life. And straight away you can see, yes, you know, probably a fake Christian leader. Yeah. And then um, there's an appeal as well of some form. So it might be sex, money, success, power, promises, and the feel-good factor. Yeah. We've got one guy, he uh, talks just about the feel-good factor, how wonderful you are and how good you are. The reality is you're not wonderful. You're a sinner and you need redemption and you need repentance. That's a reality. So if I tell you, oh, yeah, I know, there are some problems and, you know, but really God loves you and, and you are so nice. You are in the creation of God. You are made in the image of God and, and that has got a very special meaning and everything will be good and fine. Uh, you will go to hell feeling good and fine, but it doesn't really deal with the issue. You are a sinner and you need to repent. That, that's really what it comes down to. And it doesn't care who you are unless you're Jesus Christ. You are a sinner. You've got sin in your life. And he needs dealing with. And he needs dealing with on God's terms. And God's terms is Jesus Christ, who needs to forgive you. And you need to turn away from your sin. You need to turn away from what you've done wrong. Uh, so the feel-good factor doesn't come in. And very often, the problems we've got in our lives are the result of sin. It doesn't sound good. doesn't sound nice. It's the truth. That's what the Bible says. And, and, and you need to deal with it. But these guys, they come along and they give you the feel-good factor. They give you promises of money, of health, of power, of success. And, and sometimes there's a phenomenal amount of sex appeal there as well. Um, it's quite, quite amazing. I mean, I mean I'm, I'm just sometimes totally horrified when I see what is going on within the Christian world and, and how people are taken, you know, as stupid and um, as fools. And some people enrich themselves, you know, shamelessly. Um, sometimes they've got, uh, they come up with this deeper knowledge and understanding thing. Yeah. So you've got, it's almost like Gnosticism, where knowledge is the answer to understanding God, and deeper knowledge is the answer to really getting to know Him. You've got the inner circle as well, the inner circle and the outer circle. So the inner circle is sometimes like a clergy, and I've seen this in one church, uh, you had the inner circle, and they called them the church leaders. And once you were in the inner circle, you were sort of elevated, and you, you know, you got close to the the top leader, the top dog of the the whole organization, and uh, there was great honor and great distinction with this this title. And and then you had the commoners, you know, the clergy. Just wrong, just absolutely wrong. But but that's one way how you can recognize fake Christian leaders. Um, I have to think about Jesus. Jesus washed the feet of his disciples and he said, I'm doing it to you. Do the same. If you get a church leader, he's going to be the guy who, who might even wash your car. And uh, if your pastor comes to your house and he washes your car, I'm telling you, have utmost respect for this guy. Don't dis discard him. If a pastor, you know, helps you and even in mundane things. Uh, I mean, today I've just been unblocking a toilet. I mean, I can say this, it's not... I think I caused it myself, the problem, but um, but if some guy comes around you because an old lady in the church has got a blocked toilet and the pastor comes around and unblocks it, that's the guy you need to respect and that's the guy you need to listen to. 
not the guy who tells you some fairy tale story about give me your money and God's going to bless you. Give me your money and you'll be healed. Not that guy. If a pastor comes to, you know, the, the person who's got cancer and is about to die and he sits at the bed and he spends time with him or her and he, he prays for her and he also prays for healing. Um, sometimes God heals, sometimes God doesn't. I don't know why. But, but he is a guy to respect, you know. If, um, I mean, I'm going to take it one step further. The pastor takes a bad pun away and clears it out and, you know, helps somebody in those mundane things in life. He's a guy to respect. And he's a guy to, to pay homage and honor to. Not the guy who's on television mouthing off with big, fancy words, flattering people and splurting out heresy. By the fruits, you will recognize him. By the fruits. Real fruits are the guys who wash other people's feet, you know, of the law and of those who nobody, nobody sees. They are, they are the real great people in the kingdom of God, not the guys on television screens who, who just take you for a ride. Uh, what other strategies of the enemy have we, have we got? We've got um, another Jesus, yeah. Um, another Jesus is preached, not the Jesus who has died on the cross for your sins. Not the Jesus who requires repentance of you. Not the Jesus who has done everything for you, who loves you. But it's the Jesus of greatness, of power, of might who will give you all his power and all his might so that you can be a big guy. That's very often a Jesus which is preached. It's not the Jesus which is there. You know, conversion is about a five-minute prayer you don't necessarily understand and then you're a Christian. It's not the case. You need to hear Jesus knocking on the door of your heart and let him in. If you don't hear him, this is no point. More, more so, you need to really invite him. You need to be sick about your sin, about yourself. You need to hate your life in this world to come to Christ. If you don't hate your life in this world, you're not ready for the kingdom of God and you shouldn't, shouldn't really bother. Yeah, don't bother. Uh, but, but at the same time, I'm telling you, if you don't bother, the result and the end product of your life is going to be horrendous. Your eternity is going to be wasted. You'll be in pain in eternity. You will have to deal with your sin yourself. And your sin will mean eternal separation from God and eternal punishment. And, and, and there is a way out. And, and my urge to you is don't miss out on this way, but take it serious. There's no cheap grace. Somebody had to pay for it, and somebody had to pay for it very heavily. There's a painless gospel, and there's cheap grace. The painless gospel, as I mentioned before, is the, you know, recite a formula, a bit like what the Muslims do. You, know. you have to recite that there's only one God and that Muhammad is his prophet, and then you're a Muslim. It's not like that with Christianity. Christianity is an all or nothing thing. You either give your whole heart to Christ, you surrender your whole life to God, or you don't. If you don't, you don't. And if you do, you do. And that means with everything. There's no cheap grace. There's no cheap grace. Anyway, the, the strategies of the enemies are easy, you know. I'm going to, the enemy is going to tell you, um, um, about the painless gospel, about the cheap grace, about the the other Jesus. He has got this inner circle, you know, those groups where you've got the illuminated guys, you know, right in the middle somewhere and 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 you can enter the inner circle. There's a deeper knowledge and understanding, you know, so the Gnostics, so you can feel very important about yourself, very good about yourself. Then we've got, you know, all the other things as well. We've got sex, money, success, power, promises, we've got the feel good factor. Or we've got some new truth. Uh, which comes around and it should encourage you to, to go for it. So how do we deal with, with all these issues as genuine Christians? You know, we've, we've got all this stuff going on around us. You know, we, we are dealing with a church which is, which is getting faker by the day you know, when we look around. And I'm, again, I'm not knocking the church down the road with a guy who's got a heart for Christ spends his last penny on keeping keeping it going and on helping people in the community. You know, selling his you know, may only have one shirt and one pair of trousers. But but his heart is, is is there for God. And these guys are around, they're all over the place. 
but nobody looks at them anymore because of these TV people, of these fraudsters, these charlatans on TV. Big question is, how, can we, how should we deal with it? The first one is, the first answer is, you need to understand what is happening. You, you have to open your eyes. You have to use discernment to understand what is happening in this world around us. You have to open your eyes to the strategies of the enemy and just see how much falseness is around you. How do you know what is false and what is real? And the only answer is you keep your nose in the, in the book, in the Bible. If you can read, which I'm sure most of you can, if you can afford a Bible and you have one, if you don't have one, let me know and I'll try my best to get you one. Um, you have to keep your nose in the book, in the Bible. Read it and, and try and understand what is the core message of the Bible and what are these guys telling you on television. Once you find the discrepancy between, you know, the false teachers on television, again, I'm not saying all are, but a lot of them are, um, you need to distance yourself from false teachers. You don't entertain them. You don't offer them the hand of fellowship. I mean, Paul says in, in one instance that you shouldn't even eat with them. Uh, you shouldn't even invite them into your house. You shouldn't even greet them on the street. Why? If you greet them on the street, you acknowledge them and you validate that these guys are right. You shouldn't. But you must sever fellowship with these guys. Um, so again, just to clarify, when, when Jude talks about fight for the faith, um, our fight, this is the maximum we do, is we don't kill anybody, we don't injure anybody, we don't go into any sort of jihad like Muslims have to do. We just sever our fellowship from them. We point out these guys are not from us, we've got nothing to do with them, and that's it. That's what we leave it at. God is their judge, God is going to deal with them, and when their time has come, their time has come. So we shouldn't really engage into a witch hunt, which has happened in medieval times, and you know, once we have found the heretic, burn him at the stake. That's that's not our job. That's not really what we need to do, and the Bible doesn't condone this in any way. Um, but what we should do is we should stand for the truth, and we should stand for the Word of God, and we should make it public as well. And also, we should distance ourselves from these guys. And we get to the end of our talk, and, and probably the time. And I can say I distance myself very vehemently from Benny Hinn. I consider him to be a false teacher. I consider him to be a charlatan. Uh, I encourage you and and uh, encourage you to look at some of the healing crusades, critical assessments of his healing crusades, of who is getting to the front and who is not getting to the front, of how many miracles, 35 miracles have taken place with somebody sick as being healed. Uh, I do not doubt that God heals. I know that God heals. I do not even think that, you know, God cannot heal in a Benny Hinn crusade. I think despite Benny Hinn, he can heal people even in one of his crusades. Uh, but when you look at his organization and you look behind the scene, you see corruption at the highest level. It's the same as Kenneth Copeland, Mike Murdoch. Uh, when you look at Paula White, and uh, Joel Osteen, um, I mean, Joel Osteen, he, he just does the, you know, uh, the tranquility sermon to, uh, to give you some tranquilizers, keep your soul quiet and calm. You might be longing for repentance, but you listen to Joel Osteen and uh, you don't need repentance anymore uh, because everything is fine, according to him. It's not the truth. Um, you need to repent. You need to face your sin head on collide with it and surrender to Christ. Um, Paula White, she's a very intelligent woman. I've listened to some of her stuff. Very intelligent. Problem is, a lot of the stuff she's saying is not right. Um, and again, you, you get the whole prosperity thing, the whole success thing. These guys are millionaires on the back of your money. Uh, not necessarily your money, but on the back of the money of many poor Christians who are struggling to uh, to make the next day and, and also bear in mind that this money goes away from the local church, goes away from the guy who's just down the down the road, you know, with his one shirt and one pair of trousers, trying to get the local church to work and trying to help the community where he is. I would encourage you if you give money, give it to your local community, give it to those who are around you. 
don't give it to a P.O. box unless you are distinctly guided by God to do so. And that is a really sad state of affairs. Peter Popov, you know, he is exposed many times, he's been exposed many times, and um, um, he's still around. Yeah. He's a liar. He's been faking divine inspiration, and uh, he's just a liar. And this guy's still around, and people fought for him. Um, T.D. Jakes, T.D. Jakes, uh, he has got like his feasts where he uh, got like open new ages, like Oprah Winfrey and others who uh, who have got a pretty strong anti-Christian message, and uh, he's sharing a platform with her. And you think, what is this guy all about? Uh, is is this real? What this guy is doing? Anyway, I'm going to finish this talk. You know, there are a lot of wolf in sheep clothing. You need to guard yourself as the Christian community. We need to rise up against these people. We need to disown them. Uh, many of these guys, especially guys like Benny Hinn and Copeland, they assume sort of de facto apostolic status. We need to rise up against them and deny them this status and say they are fake, they are wrong, they are not of us, we don't want them. They're not Christian. They're not proclaiming biblical Christianity. We separate ourselves from these guys. We've got nothing to do with them. And, um, and we need to warn those who are tied up with these guys. Uh, that's very important. Okay, going to close on this call. Just be alert. Before I um, sign off, I just want to reiterate the statement. I do not claim to know whether these guys are Christians or not. Many of them, I'm sure, are not. As Jesus said, by the fruits, you will know them. By their fruits, you will know them. Um, some of them may just be you know, heavily deceived. Um, and they don't realize it. Obviously, if you're deceived, you don't, don't realize it. I may be deceived, and it's your job to make sure that what I'm saying is correct by... Going back to the Bible, that's, that's all I'm saying. You need to go back to the Bible. What Michael here is saying has to be verified by the Word of God. So please, please do that. And, um, but otherwise, it's just a warning. Just be careful with these guys. Be careful of what these guys are telling you. And, um, and don't be manipulated by them. Don't be taken in by them. You know, if you... I mean, most of these guys are all about money. And they're about extracting money out of your pocket. The last thing I would encourage you to do is be giving, be generous, but give to the poor. Give to those who cannot give back to you. Give to those who don't promise you anything. These guys, they all give you big promises, but yeah, obviously they don't deliver. They've got all these wonderful testimonies of you know, how people gave them their money and then the next day they were really rich. Snake oil merchants, that's all I say. Give your money to those who really need it. Give them to the poor in your community. It's important to give, and there's no doubt about that. If you've got money and you've got access, you should give. You know, should you live in uh, incredible riches, it is be between you and God the way you, you, live, you lead your life. But, but I would encourage you to be giving. I don't even believe in tithing. I believe in giving. Um, give to your ability according to your ability. That's New Testament. Give the way you can afford to without endangering the people around you. That is, if you are the provider, your kids, your wife, your relatives, make sure they are okay. The Bible says if somebody doesn't care for his relatives, he's worse than a godless person. That's what Paul says. So make sure you you know, look after your own, not after yourself, after your own people, your family, that they are okay. But also make sure that you give to those who are in need, if you can. And, um, you know, if somebody asks you, give them. Try and give them, if you can. Okay. I just want to encourage you, and I'm going to close on this, to, to just keep your mindset to alertness. And... 
and watch out for the deceivers who are trying to, take, to, to get you and to take you. Okay, God bless and bye-bye from Michael here at Seismic Radio. Our website is at www.seismicradio.org. Uh, you can contact us at info at seismicradio.org. God bless and bye-bye.